Good morning. I'm Sophie Rovner from the American Chemical Society. Welcome to this news briefing from the ACS Spring 2019 National Meeting in Orlando. We're joined today by Dr. Catherine Maloney and Connor Brandenburg of Point Loma Nazarene University. They're studying a newly identified antibacterial agent that could treat a disease that affects citrus trees. Dr. Maloney. Thank you. Um, so uh, in my lab at Point Loma Nazarene University, um, my students are working on discovering um, antibiotics against citrus greening disease, which is a really devastating um, disease of, of citrus here in Florida. And we first became interested in this, um, in this disease because, um, because of its similarity to another disease we've been working on called Pierce's disease of grapevine. And so I've got a slide. Um, and so the reason, um, the reason we found this really interesting is that if you look at um, grapevines and citrus trees, they're both clonally propagated. And so that means in the upper left-hand side of this, um, of this image, all of the grapevines that you see in that orchard are genetically identical to each other, at least in terms of the plant genetics. Um, and similarly, all the citrus trees that you see in the lower picture are genetically identical to each other. But a common observation that, um, that is found in these um, these groves and um, uh, and vineyards under high disease pressure is that you'll see one or a few um, plants that are completely healthy looking, asymptomatic for the disease. Um, we call these either disease escaped or survivor uh, plants. And um, and so even though they're genetically identical to all their neighbors, um, they're doing, doing much better. And so one of the hypotheses that we had, and this is uh, work that's collaborative with, um, with folks at University of California, Riverside, um, we hypothesized that maybe there's something living inside of these plants that's conferring um, some kind of protection against the, the bacterium, possibly by producing an antibiotic. Um, and so we pursued this hypothesis with, um, with grapevine, and so the next slide shows, um, shows how we did that. So this was an undergraduate student in my lab um, who uh, took um, fungi that were isolated from the su survivor disease-escaped uh, grapevine and isolated the molecule radicinin at the bottom of the slide, um, which, uh, which had antibiotic activity against the causative agent. And um, so we've just started this process with citrus, it's, um, it w but we're following that same, uh, that same procedure. But because we had radicinin on hand, we, um, we tested it, or my collaborators tested it against the bacterium that we, um, that we use as our surrogate for the bacterium that causes citrus disease. And, um, and so, and it tested um, positive, it inhibits that bacterium as well. So I'll let Connor take it from here. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Connor Brandenburg. I'm a fourth year undergraduate at Point Loma Nazarene University. And my work in Dr. Maloney's lab entails the development of a chemical synthesis of radicinin. Um, so we were looking at um, uh, improving an 11-step synthesis that was published in 1969 uh, with a more succinct four-step synthesis uh, with uh, using kind of more principles of green chemistry. And then along the way, we would peel off our synthetic intermediates and test those in an auger diffusion bioassay for biological activity against Pierce's disease and citrus greening disease. Um, and that data is visualized in the heat map on this slide. Thank you. Are there any questions? And if so, please state your name and affiliation. Hello. So it's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry magazine. Um, I understand that you isolated several fungal species. And I'm just wondering if those fungal species are active anyway, could you not just introduce some fungi to these plants? Um, and how active is radicinin compared with the actual fungi collection, if you like, because may would there be synergistic effects amongst the fungi? I don't know. Yeah, so it's, it's a great question, and it certainly could be. Um, so our collaborators, in the case, I can speak more to the grapevine problem just because we've had more time to work on it. Um, so I know that my collaborators have tried introducing some of these strains um, and conveniently, since the um, since the grapevines you you graft onto like a rootstock, and so they they would take the um, 
take a, a twig of, of whatever they're going to graft on and actually suck the fungal spores through it in order to infect it before grafting onto the tree. So that is a possibility. Um, some strains worked better than others. So like this Cochleobolus strain that um, was on the previous slide does not work well in that way. Um, but, um, but there were others that did. And so, yeah, absolutely. We're exploring that, uh, exploring that as a possibility as well. I think there's an attractiveness about having a, a small molecule that you can put in a jar and, you know, transport. And, and so if we had a, a small molecule drug that would certainly have, or not drug, but, but something that we could spray on plants or something like that, I think it would have utility also. And so I think we're approaching all of these from a lot of different ways. And I think ultimately the more, you know, the more things we try, the, the better the odds. And in terms of safety, how safe is radicinin or some of the analogs that you've been yeah. looking at? I mean, would this require, I mean, what sort of doses would be needed? Would you need to wash the fruits or? Right, afterwards? right. So, um, so we, we're still working on dosing. I mean, we're still working on trying to even to get it into plants. So, the, so we had kind of a, have a kind of a stockpile of radicinin um, because there's a lot to figure out with formulating it for plants. And then obviously once we are able to get it into plants, then we'll have to answer a lot of questions about the safety for, uh, for human consumption. Um, it, you know, in terms of its known activities, it's known to be phytotoxic um, at, at certain doses. Obviously we'd want to avoid those doses. Um, and um, it, it, we haven't tested it, you know, against or in um, mammals at all. Yeah. And, and I was just interested because Connor mentioned it was around or is known since 1969. Has nobody else sort of looked at applications? Um, so it's been explored. Um, or it, it's it sort of pops up here and there, but I think um, I think I, yeah, I don't I don't have a good answer to that question. Um, it, it hadn't been explored for certainly for um, citrus greening or for Pierce's disease mm -hmm. before this. Um, and th there's so many, you know, there's so many sort of no natural products. We'd love to discover something new as well, obviously. Um, but, uh, okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, Pela Buslik, uh, American Chemical Society. Um, I've, I've noticed in your abstract, you refer to, uh, to a compound named radicinin and, uh, uh, apparently it's an interesting looking lactone there, uh, there. And uh, uh, does it does it actually get into the plant? The plant, uh, it some of the the fungi that that I I know that that produce this stuff. Uh, one version of Alternaria is a pretty uh, serious citrus pest uh, or, or disease causing organism. So I'm not entirely sure uh, sure where we're standing with that, uh, that thing because. Uh, the species that uh, that produces it apparently is is kind of out there in left field, not not uh, growing on on real real plants, commercial plants anyway. Uh, but any, uh, what's what's your feeling about uh, radicin and 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 the compound or any related compound uh, as as a an antibiotic uh, for the uh, for citrus? I I mean. We're just we've so far we've only tested it in vitro, so we haven't done any anything in planta or approaching in planta with citrus yet. Um, we're further along, although still in the, you know early on testing it in the um, grapevines, um, trying to get a formulation that works. To go back to your um, your question about the the fungus that makes radicin, so there's it, it's actually been isolated from from a variety of fungi now, um, including, you know, including this Cochleobolus. And something that I, I didn't show on the slide, but that was, was kind of cool, is when, um, when our collaborator, Philippe Rolshausen at, um, at UC Riverside, um, when he isolated fungi from both the healthy, you know, disease-escaped grapevines and the, um, the symptomatic grapevines and compared those strains, the Cochleobolus actually was only observed in the disease escaped vines. So, you know, it's circumstantial evidence, but it, it certainly 
supports the idea that the cochleobolus isn't harming the grapevines. Um, and so I think there are a lot of redistinant producers, some of which are certainly um, plant pests, but some, some of which appear not to be um, like, like cochleobolus. So as, as I, I take it, you haven't really done, uh, done a very large scale uh, kind of testing and, uh, uh, to prove the, the hypothesis that, okay, there is this, uh, this fungus uh, uh, deleterious or not, it associated uh, uh, with uh, plants that look healthy or act healthy. So you're right. We have not done a, a large-scale study. Um, in the, the Citrus Project, we've, so there's, um, our, our project is a collaboration between like 12 different um, PIs, and we do have um, folks who are looking specifically at the um, uh, non-culturable or non-culture-independent uh, methods, looking at the, the DNA of organisms that are in the survivor trees versus the, um, the symptomatic trees. And so we are doing more systematic things with citrus. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. Well, you you need to. to contact somebody in Florida because they, they do need that kind oh, of Oh, we have, help. we actually, so yesterday we just drove out to visit uh, a member of our, of the board on our, uh, or our advisory board for our grant um, and got to see, yeah, it's, it's a huge, it's a huge problem and we have um, some very interested stakeholders who would like to well, see this work it, succeed. Yeah, but like it's, it's, a, it's a large economic problem yes. around here because Absolutely. Uh, in these central Florida counties grow probably more citrus than California uh, mm. or the, the whole state. Hi, so it's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry again. And just on that question, because I wondered, um, since it seems to be a bacteria issue, have people also been looking at probiotics? I know there's a lot of work going on in actually adding bacteria to soil or spraying plants with bacteria that compete against the um, deleterious bacteria. And I just wonder, you know, would that be another? Uh, it, it's a really interesting question. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, yeah, I don't know if folks are working on that. I, that yeah. sounds really interesting. And, and uh, about the, the formulation, I know you were still looking at possible formulations. I mean, what do you, what's your, are you, have you any thinking on whether it might be better as a seed treatment or as a um, spray or? So for the grapevine, I mean, ideally we'd like, we'd, we'd like to be able to treat the, the, you know, adult plants that are already aff aff afflicted. Um, we, so we looked at, we thought, we thought briefly about soil drench, but just our compound limit, like our quantity of compound available, soil drench is a very wasteful kind of um, approach. So um, we've, we've, most of what we've done so far has been with um, spraying the leaves. Um, but something we, I know, and, and again, I'm a chemist, so I'm, I'm definitely speaking outside of my expertise here, but um, our collaborator I know was, I think the next thing he was gonna try was like a petiole feeding method where they sort of break off and, and sort of hook up a little, um, a little tube to the petiole and try to feed it that way, which would be a little bit, it's a little more labor intensive, but more efficient way to get a, a compound into the tree okay, or the thank vine. You. Thank you. Laura Cassidy with ACS. Um, does the structure of radicinin give you any clues as to how it kills bacteria, kind of the mechanism? I'll let Connor, Connor tackle that. Sure. Um, so <clears throat> if we could pull up the, is the structure on there? Awesome, cool. So radicinin is that uh, last step in that syn synthetic scheme. It has this sterically unhindered Michael acceptor uh, that we propose uh, is kind of this active portion of the molecule. Um, in previous work in Dr. Maloney's lab has shown that radicinin it inhibits uh, a protease activity in uh, uh, lysed cells of xylella fastidiosa, uh, which is the causal agent of Pierce's disease. Um, and uh, we've hypothesized um, and uh, shown in uh, that assay, the cell lysite assay, uh, that it actually binds uh, to cysteine thiols of uh, proteins in xylella uh, covalently at that double bond, that sterically unhindered Michael acceptor. So that's our, our proposed uh, mode of action. 
Okay, and do you expect that radicinin would be pretty broad spectrum and would kill many types of bacteria or only those responsible for the grape and the orange diseases? That's a good, that's a good question. Um, I think, I, I, again, I'm speaking outside of my expertise, but um, I, I would think it could likely target anything that has proteases. So I think mm. that, yeah. That's, okay, but you haven't yeah. tested it. I have not tested range. it okay. against others. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, Katie Cottingham from ACS. So how specific is uh, radicinin for these diseases? And I was also wondering when this could, when this could be available for farmers, if you have any clues on oh, that. Oh, yes. Um, so, uh, so th yeah, specificity, we haven't tested it against, at least to my knowledge, I, I, should, I should say I haven't checked recently with my collaborators, but um, I am not aware of us testing it against a wide spectrum of, um, of bacteria. And, oh, availability. Um, so one other thing that we're, um, that we're exploring, because the path to approval for a pure compound is pretty long. Um, and so, um, so we got advice from a, a friend of mine who's at one of at a uh, natural products based um, agricultural company, and he suggested that we try formulating the actual culture broth, sort of un, un um, uh, modified culture broth, and that apparently the the approval process is much shorter um, for for culture broth, which is makes no sense to me whatsoever. But um, but in any case, so that's something else. So in the um, the next round of implanted testing, we've got a whole um, a whole large volume of culture broth. If that were successful, then I think both the timeline for approval would be would be good. I think getting uh, one of these companies interested to kind of mass produce um, culture broth would be become more feasible. And so then I think that could be a real possibility. Any further questions? All right, well, thank you. The archived version of this session will soon be posted at bit.ly slash ACS Live underscore Orlando 2019. Please join us for our next press conference at 10.30 a.m. today on a muscle-like material that expands and contracts in response to light. Thank you. <laughs>